studying the Old Testament book of Joel this week, and if you read through the book of Joel, there are a couple of things that you notice right away. Joel really has a couple of of uh, significant points of emphasis. One of those is this picture of the day of the Lord. As a matter of fact, you'll see five times in Joel uh, the day of the Lord is mentioned. The day of the Lord. In a moment, I want to read five of those passages to you. So Joel is about the day of the Lord. The other point of emphasis in Joel in the midst of the teaching about the day of the Lord, the descriptions of the day of the Lord, is also a prophetic passage about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's a passage that Peter refers to on the day of Pentecost when the the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the believers in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and Peter rises up to speak and to preach. He says, this is what was prophesied by the prophet Joel. What we're experiencing in this outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost is what Joel prophesied about. And so there are two points of emphasis that I I see really strongly in Joel, the day of the Lord and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Today, I want to share some things about the day of the Lord. But just to to bring into context how Joel Joel describes those things, Joel uh, uses a, a present situation and something that was very prominent in their minds at the time. And that is there was a a devastating plague of of locusts that had brought about just massive destruction, such as had never been seen by those in Joel's day. Joel uses that destruction to use that as an illustration to prepare the people to think about the day of the Lord. And he does that in such a way that that he leads from what they could see and what they had experienced and and what their eyes had witnessed and and the devastation that was so real to them. Most believe that Joel was was living around Jerusalem. uh, The references in Joel are very sparse in terms of helping us put a date or a time exactly when this takes place, but the references there do, uh, do indicate to me that Joel most likely lived in Jerusalem. He's prophesying in Judah. We've talked about the two kingdoms when Israel split, Judah and Israel. So Joel is, is talking to those in, in Judah, but he takes that situation and the devastation from the locust, and he describes the day of the Lord drawing from that experience. Now, before I I, I read these five passages about the day of the Lord, I want to stop there for a moment and say something. There are times in our lives that we experience uh, devastation. And I'm not saying that you experience a literal plague of locusts in your life. But maybe you you have experienced something else devastating in your life. Maybe you've experienced some things that are destructive in your life. And there are lots of different kinds of destruction. There are lots of different kinds of ways that we experience devastation in our lives. Our hearts can become broken through many different types of situations. We can experience loss. We can experience drought. We can experience desert. We can experience loneliness. We can experience the kinds of things that, that, that cause us to recognize that there's, there has been loss and destruction and devastation in our lives. And there can become a type of barrenness in us, a type of waste. I don't know if you've ever seen, you know, a tree that's been destroyed by insects, but you take the worst tree you've ever seen in your yard that's been destroyed by insects and you multiply that a thousand times and that's what it looked like in Joel's experience here. Now transfer that a moment to your life and you have those times in your life where there is, there is a barrenness and a waste and you begin to wonder. You begin to wonder about your fruitfulness. You begin to wonder about your purpose. You begin to wonder about peace. You begin to wonder about the future. You begin to wonder, where am I going and what's going to take place? And and what I want to say this morning about that is that pain is real 
and that devastation is real and that barrenness is real. And as bad as it is sometimes, that is the best time for us to begin to look elsewhere for answers. If we've been trying to come up with solutions on our own, if we've been trying to heal it, to fix it, to make it better, to, to, to find a way to erase the pain, and there are lots of methods in our culture today to ease pain. But the one method that Joel communicates so clearly is, is turn to the Lord. Turn to the Lord. And he uses their devastation to provide an illustration of the judgment that's coming from God, of the final judgment of all the enemies of God. He uses that to point them toward the day, the day of the Lord as that final judgment. But he also uses that to point the people to God, not just because of his judgment that is coming, but because it's an opportunity to repent or to turn to the Lord, to repent and to find comfort and healing and blessing and hope in the Lord. I want to I wanna read through these passages and then I want to say some more about that. Look at these passages. How does Joel describe the day of the Lord? Joel says this in verse 1 or verse 15 of chapter 1. He says, Woe! Because of that day, for the day of the Lord is near and will come as devastation from the Almighty. Joel says, you've seen the devastation of the locusts? That, that, that is, that is a, a, a place to begin to understand the devastation that the judgment of God can bring. So he begins this passage, 115, by saying, Whoa, whoa, the day of the Lord is near. Look at chapter 2. In verse 1, check out this second reference here. Blow the horn in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the residents of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. In fact, it is near. It is near. The recurring themes that you'll see in these references about the day of the Lord. In fact, they're similar. There are over 30 references in the Old Testament to the day of the Lord. And there are similar themes in those other references. If you look to Isaiah, for example, or to Ezekiel and the references there to the day of the Lord. Look at the third reference in chapter 2 and verse 11. The Lord raises his voice in the presence of his army. His camp is very large. Those who carry out his command are powerful. Indeed, the day of the Lord is terrible and dreadful. Who can endure it? Let me go on. Chapter 2, verse 31 says this. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awe-inspiring day of the Lord comes. Finally, look at chapter 3, verse 14. Chapter 3. Verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near, is near in the valley of decision. Now, as I said, there's some recurring themes. One of the themes is, is clearly the devastating judgment of God. As you read through, and I have only selected the individual verses with a reference to the day of the Lord to read, but if you read, Joel is a, is a short book, and you can read through these, these three chapters very quickly. There are, there are several pictures that Joel provides of the judgment of the Lord, the devastation, the day of the Lord, the impending judgment. That's, that's one of the themes that I would say you pick up on very quickly in Joel about the day of the Lord. The other is that it is near. Did you hear that? Over and over in different ways and, and sometimes in the same way, Joel will say, it is near, it is near, it is near. <clears throat> the best word I could use to describe that is it is imminent. It is imminent. It is, it is near. It is coming. It is sure. It is certain. The day of the Lord will come. It will come, and Joel wants to impress upon the residents of Jerusalem and of Judah and to us 
who read now thousands of years after the fact that the day of the Lord is imminent, it is real, it is coming, and it's a great and a terrible and an awe-inspiring day. He wants us to see that in these descriptions. So quickly, quickly, I want to say some things about that and then lead us into prayer this morning. As you consider this, why is, is it important for us to understand the day of the Lord? Why? Because it answers some very deep questions about life that we tend to wrestle with, and we especially wrestle with these things in our times of, of, of drought and barrenness and devastation and when we experience things even in our own lives and looking forward to see if what lies ahead in terms of God's judgment we tend to ask where are we going where are we going and I mean that in a big sense I don't mean that in a sense of today tomorrow the next day but where is creation going what is God, what is God's ultimate plan what is God's ultimate purpose beyond the life of, of, of an individual, beyond the life of even a, a, a group of people, a, a local church, a family, beyond that, where is God's creation going? And the day of the Lord helps us to under, understand that. It helps us to answer some of those questions. And, and another question that is along with that is, when will God set things right? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever asked that question? Sure, we've all asked that. When something's not fair, when we try to measure things up and, and we try to look at it and we, we, we try to decide, is that justice? Is that right? Is it, is it the way it ought to be? There, there are just so many things about the world. We look around and there are times that we ask as the Psalms lift up so many times, when will God set things right? Good word for that is vindication. When will God vindicate the righteous? When will God vindicate the righteous? Is God, as a matter of fact, we get to the point and there's this, there's this tendency to cycle through that to say, God, if you don't, when, when are you? Will you? And you begin to doubt, will God ever really, will God ever pull the scales out and say this is righteous and this is unrighteous? And, and the day of the Lord is, is a, a way for Joel to say there will be a day of vindication when the enemies of God will be defeated and the righteous will enjoy victory. That's the last thing I would say is, is God, is God really going to be the final victor? Is God really going to be the final victor? Is God really going to win? Is God really going to emerge? In, as we look in the scope of, of the future, as we look out there and we look to the vindication of the righteous and God setting things right, there's a big question that we ask sometimes, and that is, does God really win? And the day of the Lord is a resounding, God is the victor. God will vindicate righteousness will prevail and as as joel answers that question and the other questions joel gives us a picture of the day of the lord and of course it's awe inspiring of course when we talk about vindication when we talk about victory when we talk about god winning of course it's awe inspiring and of course it's great and terrible in any other way you choose to express it because it, we're talking about God, the ultimate victor. So Joel gives us that and he says, wow, you see, you see the devastation of the locust. You see what's taking place. Use that picture to imagine the judgment of God on those who are his enemies. Draw from that. Draw from that experience in your life. And what, what I would say to you today is, okay, if you've experienced brokenness and barrenness and destruction and devastation and pain and loneliness, those wilderness and desert times in your life, use that to help understand the final judgment of God. That's what Joel does. He says, use that 
to help create a vision of what it's going to be like for, ju- for God's judgment to be pronounced in the day of the Lord. It's a great and a terrible day. It's an awe-inspiring day. And I love the translation in chapter 3 and in, in, in verse 14 where it says that multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. I, I want to take you forward quickly with that thought. Now, the Old Testament, I mentioned over 30 references in the Old Testament to the day of the Lord. There are also references in the New Testament to the, the day of the Lord. And I want to take you to a long passage here. I'm going to read several verses from 2 Peter. If you want to turn to 2 Peter, the third chapter, what I want to do is read uh, beginning of verse 8 and read all the way down to the first part of verse 15. I want you to listen carefully to what Peter has recorded for us about the day of the Lord. Peter says this in verse 8. He says, Dear friends, don't let this one thing escape you. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you. But is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but instead, but all to come to repentance. The Lord is patient with us not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Listen, but the day of the Lord. How does Peter describe the day of the Lord? Peter, the same follower of Jesus who stood up on the day of Pentecost, who finds his boldness to preach to thousands in the power of the Holy Spirit that has just been poured out upon him. Peter, who preaches that passage from Joel and identifies what they're experiencing with the prophecy of Joel. This same Peter, older now, more experienced now, this same Peter says this. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved. And the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. Sounds a lot like Joel. If you read those three chapters of Joel, you'll see that Peter, it sounds a lot like the words of Joel. Now, what he says is, since all things are to be destroyed in this way, all these things are to be destroyed in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness. Really? Before I read verse 12, really? Since this is what the day of the Lord's gonna be like, since this is what we see in the day of the Lord. So as we read in Joel and as we learn about the day of the Lord, though it's hundreds of years before Peter preaches and before Peter records this, Though it's hundreds of years, Peter says, since we understand what the day of the Lord is like, Then, if we understand that, then it is clear what kind of people we ought to be. Peter says it's pretty clear the way we ought to live since this is what the description of the day of the Lord, the vindication, the victory, the judgment, since we understand that, it's clear what kind of people we ought to be. Look at this. It says, in, in holy conduct and godliness, as you wait for and earnestly desire the coming of the day of God. Now, as you read through Joel, there's, there's a good possibility that you're not going to earnestly desire this day that is described in Joel. As you read what Peter has to say about the day of the Lord, it could be that you're not, you're not eager and earnestly desiring the day of the Lord, but we're going to talk about that in a minute. 
And he goes on to say this, the heavens will be on fire and be dissolved because of it and the elements will melt with the heat, but based on his promise, we wait for the new heavens and a new earth where righteousness will dwell. Therefore, dear friends, while you wait for these things, make every effort to be found at peace with him without spot or blemish. Also, regard the patience of our Lord as an opportunity for salvation. I love that last part, that that, that first part of chapter, uh, of, of verse 15. Chapter 3, verse 15, the first part of that verse. I love that as we wait, we consider God's patience as an opportunity for salvation. Now, here's how I want to wrap up today. Peter takes what Joel teaches us, and he gives us an application. What are we to do? You say, Pastor Paul, I don't, I don't like to read about the day of the Lord. It's about fiery judgment. It's about the destruction of the heaven and the earth. It's about the judgment of God's enemy. I don't like to read about that. And besides, you know, if, if in fact Joel is writing, you know, between two and three centuries ago, why, why, why should I pay attention to that? Because Joel talks like it's getting ready to happen and it hadn't happened. And Peter helps us understand something. You see, if God says, I'm coming back the day after tomorrow, that could mean 2,000 years. You ever thought about that? And if he says the day after that, it might be 3,000 years. And so our temptation is to say, oh, the Lord is slack. The Lord has delayed his return which can lead us to say, is the Lord. We've gone through another, yet another big wave in 2012 of date setting and get ready and it's coming and here's when it's going to be. Here's why it's going to be. And every time we go through that, and I can't tell you how many of those I've gone through in my lifetime of when the Lord is coming back. He was supposed to come back two weeks before Lynn and I got married. That concerned me. 88 reasons why he's coming back in 1988. We go through that, and here's my concern with that. One of my greatest concerns is is that it feeds doubt. And there are those who don't earnestly desire the return of the Lord for the right reasons who say, well, that's just another myth. He's not coming back. There's no such thing as the day of the Lord. Why should we care? Why should we listen to another? And it just feeds that instead of turning to the truth of God's word and looking to what God has to say about the day of the Lord and about the return of our Savior and what our attitude should be to the imminent fact that he will come again. And what is our response to that? Peter says this. Peter says that we should view the patience of God with us as an opportunity to turn to him. The patience of God. Don't miss Peter revealing something about the heart of God because Peter says that he's not slack in his promise. He's not delaying his promise as some understand what it means to delay. The Lord is patient with us because he doesn't want any to perish. When his judgment comes, it will be final. And in the terms of Joel and both Peter in his interpretation of Joel, it will be devastating 
And when God vindicates his name with judgment, it will be final. And it will be complete. And when God is victorious, he is victorious. And you say, I'm fearful when I read that. Well, we should fear God. We shouldn't make light of his judgments. But let that fear be a reverent and a holy fear that allows us also to see the patience of God that says, my patience gives you an opportunity for salvation. And he says, make every effort to be found at peace with God. And that's where I want to close today. Because I want to, I want to share with you, honestly and sincerely, I believe what I read in Joel. I believe what I read in Peter. I believe in the judgment of God. I believe it with all of my heart. I believe it. And I believe that I have a God-given calling to continue to say, make every effort to be at peace with God, to live soberly, to live a holy life, and to recognize that what Joel does is Joel leads the people of God and says, look at the devastation. Look at the day of the Lord that's coming. Now return to God. And he says some, some beautiful things about God his love for his people, the way that God, as Peter picks up on, the way that God receives us when we turn to him, the peace, the wholeness that I'm talking about. Long after Joel prophesied, Jesus came and he died on the cross and he paid the price for every sin that has ever and ever will be committed with his blood that he shed on the cross for you and me. And he offers that peace to us. And he says, here is a peace. God's final judgment is real. But you don't have to face that judgment. Turn to me. We encourage you this morning, find peace with God. Find that peace with God. The way to find that the Bible says, if you will confess with your mouth, believe with your heart, that's where the peace is found, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. I want to close and ask you to pray. Here's, here's the way I want to do this this morning. Sober message. God wants to make us whole this morning. God wants to make us whole this morning. I don't know what your pain is. I don't know what your devastation is. I don't know what your, I don't know whether you're at peace with God or not. You know that and God knows that. But I do know that I want to lead you to him right now. So I want you to, I want you to just take a moment, bow your heads together with me.